The next presentation will be by Jody Balf, who worked on a nanosatellite concept study, extrasolar planet transit light curve analysis in search for Earth analogs. So extrasolar planets, or planets orbiting stars outside our solar system, are a very unique and rising area in astrophysics. We estimate there are billions of extrasolar planets out there, and then this could be a major source of understanding for the universe. In addition, we're searching for a true Earth analog, so an Earth-like planet that could be a potential source of extraterrestrial life or a safe zone for humans in case of a catastrophe here on Earth. So, Earth is really rare in the sense that we call it a Goldilocks planet. It's not too hot that we'll all die and fry up, but it's not too cold either. So there is a really specific set of conditions that a planet must follow in order to be hospitable for life. And this is defined by a habitable zone, which is a circumstellar area around a star where liquid water can exist and therefore life can exist also. So no true Earth analogs have really been discovered. So if we look here at the planets that we've discovered, Earth analogs are estimated to be here on this graph. And as you can see, this area is relatively unpopulated. But this isn't necessarily due to the fact that they don't exist, but it's because we haven't been able to detect them ourselves. So there's two major problems in extrasolar planet research. The first problem is based on detection. Our current methods are based on radial velocity changes, which are really good at finding planets of really high masses in short orbital periods. But these aren't the planets we're looking for. These aren't the planets that are going to be Earth-like. So we need to find an alternative way to detect these extrasolar planets. In addition, we have technological limitations, namely in our satellite and our optical systems, because they, aren't, uh, they can't observe the brighter stars like the sun that we expect will harbor these Earth-like analogs. So first, let's talk about detection. So a transit is when a planet crosses in front of a central star. And then it produces, it's sort of like a mini eclipse in that there's a small drop in the luminosity. So in the light curve, we can see this small dip in the observed flux. And how can we extract information on the planet and the star just through this observed flux, just from this observed change in the uh, luminosity? So here's what the light curve looks like when we observe it. We can observe the transit depth, so how deep this is, the overall shape of the transit, the total transit duration, so from here to here, and the flat transit duration from here to here. So how can we find information on the planet and star in question with these four observables? So we go through a whole derivation scheme here, and I'm going to outline the three basic stages. First, we take these four observables, and we combine all these different parameters, because there's a certain intrinsic geometry here that we can manipulate. In addition, there's a certain intrinsic geometry to the planet orbit around the star. So using these quantities, we combine these parameters, and we try to solve for, uh, we try to s create these unique expressions that will give us information on the planet and the star. So first, we combine those four observables into these different parameters. So we get the planet-star radius ratio, because the bigger the planet is in relation to the star, the more the transit depth will change, so the more light it will block. So we get the impact parameter, which is the degree of superposition that the planet has upon the star. We get the ratio of the semi-major axis to the stellar radius, and we get an equation for the stellar density. So I'm not going to inundate you with equations here, so I'm giving you a general sort of three-stage process that we used. So we took these four observables, and then now we're going to extract five unique expressions for these so we can derive these parameters. So we derive expressions for the stellar mass, the stellar radius, the planet radius, the orbital semi-major axis, and the orbital inclination, or the angle the planet makes to the equatorial of the star. All right, so first here are the stellar characteristics. We won't dwell too much upon them, but then as you can see here, we have... Oops, we, this is the stellar density that we derive before as one of our parameter combinations. And then we can express the stellar mass as a function of this. And then x and k are just constants. And then similarly, these are a little more intuitive because they're more like taking advantage of the geometry of the orbit. So the orbital radius and the orbital inclination. But most importantly, we should focus on the planetary radius because this quantity in itself gives us a lot of information on how the planet was formed, its migration history, and it gives us a way of characterizing the planet. So as you can see here, we put the planet radius as a ratio with a solar radius. And we introduce, this is the transit depth. This is one of the things that we can directly observe and measure. And as we said before, transit depth is proportional to the ratio of the planet radius to the radius of the star. So you can introduce this scale factor here. In addition, we can express light. Okay. We can express this ratio here as a ratio of their densities, which is one of our parameter combinations. And then this density can be related to direct observables of period and total transit duration. So in this, essentially, we're taking these three, this three-stage derivation process and we're boiling down how can we get information on the star and the planet just through the observed quantities through this light curve. 
So we have five equations and we have five unknowns. That means we have unique solutions for each one of these parameters. So this means that with a light curve, we can be able to tell specific answers about the planet and star that we just observed. So this can be applied to satellite surveys. If we have a given set of light curves for a star, we can tell if it's a main sequence star, which is the ones we're looking for, that are likely to harbor Earth-like analogs, or if it's a giant variable gaseous star that would never harbor life at all in a surrounding planet. In addition, say one of the observables is hard to measure, or it's unclear. We can still, with the other three observables, constrain the parameter spaces for the other resulting planet and star characteristics, so we have a range, which is still very useful. So before we moved, another application is we took the light curve and we were able to tell information about the planet and star. We can also move in the opposite direction. Say we have a given planet and star, we can reverse engineer the corresponding light curves, which is what we did here. So here, ooh, back. So these are simulations for what would happen if an Earth-like analog were to cross Alpha Centauri B, hypothetically. So this would be the resulting light curve that we would see, which we could calculate because there's a uniqueness to the solution set of the planet and star parameters. So we model the transit of an Earth-like analog, and this would be done for any given star, which means we can develop a theoretical fit for any future data. So we discussed detection issues that occur when trying to find Earth-like analogs. So now we introduce the issue, we introduce the idea of using transit light curve analysis because the unique intrinsic geometry and the mathematical expressions we can derive as sources of information to planet and stars. So now let's turn to this two-faceted problem, let's turn to the technological issues. Because current satellites right now are not effective in finding the Earth-like analogs that we desire. So right now what we have is we have these really big bulky satellites and we send them up in space and they have to observe hundreds and thousands of stars at once. And this is a problem because the brighter stars like the sun are often too spread out or too far apart, so we can't feel the, uh, fit them into a single field of view. In addition, their optical ranges have so like, thinly distributed that when they come into, like a brighter star comes into range, it can't observe them with the precision that we need. So therefore, instead of sending one big satellite up to monitor hundreds and thousands of stars at once, why don't we send up many, many small satellites, each individually customized for the star that they're sent out to, uh, they're sent out to observe, for each individually adjusted, and then a, instead of like a one big satellite, a network of little nanosatellites. So a nanosatellite is defined as something between 1 to 10 kilograms and 30 centimeters on each side. This has never really been achievable before, but with advances in nano optics, this is now a possibility. 